those of you who don't know me, I am James Kamstra. I look after the programs and I'm also the Vice President of North Durham Nature. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Christina Davey, who will be our speaker tonight. Christina is, is well respected in the field. She's an adjunct professor at Trent University. She's also a research scientist with the Species at Risk and Wildlife Research and Monitoring section with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. She has her PhD from the University of Toronto, which she completed in 2013, studying the conservation genetics of Ontario freshwater turtles. Christina's research integrates disease ecology, behavioral ecology, and conservation genetics especially related to species at risk. And she has a real particular interest in bats, amphibians, and reptiles. I actually first met Christina through the Ontario Reptile Atlas since I was uh, the regional coordinator and we had these occasional get-togethers. She's also uh, on the board of directors for the Canadian Herb Society and she's the Ontario representative on the Committee on the Status of Species of the Endangered Wildlife in Canada, CSEWIC which as you may know is responsible for designating the status of all of our species at the national level. She has authored numerous peer reviewed scientific papers on reptiles and bats as she is highly respected at Trent University. She's taken on many grad students and uh, I keep running into students that have worked with Christina and they all speak very highly of her. So without further ado, I would like to turn over the Turn over the volume to Christina. James, thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm really glad to be here with you all tonight, and this is a nice way to take a bit of a break from pandemic life and share my love of bats. Um, can you all see one screen up there that says bats, why they're in trouble? Somebody give me a unmute and just give me a yes. This is working. Chat's working. Uh, yes. Yeah, great. Thank you. No okay, problem. wonderful. All right, well, then we can get started. Um, I will try and keep an eye on the chat, but sometimes I end up in a zone. And <laughs> so if I'm really missing something important, I will not be offended if somebody unmutes themselves and just flags the question for me. Kara. Okay, so I wanted to tell you tonight a bit about bats and mostly, mostly I want to explain to you why they're the most wonderful, fascinating and addictive things on the planet. I also want to talk a bit about why they're in trouble and I think, I think many of you have probably heard about some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about and also a bit about what you can do to help. I think before I keep going, I also want to respectfully acknowledge that I am speaking you, to you today from the treaty and traditional territories of several Anishinaabe groups. And I, in my work with species at risk, I can only do the work that I do because those species are still here on the landscape and they're only still here on the landscape because of millennia of really effective stewardship by indigenous peoples before anybody else even showed up. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that, and that work is ongoing, and I'm grateful for that as well. We're going to start with just a wild tour of bats and why they are extremely diverse and how you can use them to study pretty much anything. And I think if I was going to tell you ahead of time my key message, it would be something like bats are really amazing. They're really, really, really endangered globally. Uh, recovering them is hard but we can. So if you think about what you know about bats, um, probably you've heard several myths about bats, probably because you're a group of field naturalists, you've also had most of those myths debunked to you several times, and probably you go around explaining to children that bats are not lions, and thank you for that. Um, my, my sort of most, uh, what's the word? The, the moment where I really had like an aha moment about bat diversity and why it mattered um, actually happened while looking at this picture and I was looking at it with my kids and it had nothing to do with bats and just realized that we are on the only planet that has bats. 
and they are actually on all continents except for Antarctica, and they make up one-fifth of mammal species. So there are now over 1,400 different species of bat described. We have only eight of them here in Ontario, but they're wonderful and they make up for lack of numbers and wonderfulness. And of course, the, the big thing that everybody knows about bats is that they're the only flying mammal, right? They can fly. This is a big brown bat, and if you watch the video, you're going to watch her move her head back and forth. She's echolocating and trying to decide which way to take off. And then she's going to launch herself up into space and fly away. And they're the only group of mam mammals that can do this. Flying squirrels, of course, glide, but they can't actually sustain flight. And what this means for bats is that they can use the landscape in ways that most small mammals can't. So when you think about a mouse, you know it's going to move. An impressive distance would be a couple kilometers, right? But for a little brown bat like this one, it can move hundreds of kilometers over a month. It can move over 100 kilometers in a single night if there's somewhere that it wants to go. And so they, they don't really behave the way we expect small mammals to behave, and I, I really enjoy that. The other thing you'll notice about this picture of a little brown bat in flight is that its mouth is wide open, right? And it almost looks like it's baring its teeth at us. And I think this is one of the main sources of misunderstanding between people and bats. When you meet a bat, this is typically what it does. It's not baring its teeth, it's actually echolocating. And the species of bat that we have in Ontario have to open their mouths to echolocate because they produce that sound um, from their larynx. There are, and it has to come out of their mouth, there are species of bat that produce the sound through the nose instead, so they can make echolocation calls with their mouth closed. And people tend to find those bats much cuter looking because the photos don't always have that open mouth gaping at them, right? But in fact, this bat is just trying to figure out its surroundings, and the echolocation is exactly what it sounds like, right? The bat makes a very, very, very loud ultrasonic call it's actually about the same decibel level as a fire alarm, the kind you might have in your kitchen. So it's wonderful for us that it's ultrasonic because if you could hear them calling at night, the night would not be peaceful at all. They're flying around, they're making these very, very, very high frequency ultrasonic calls, very, very loud ones. The call goes out and when it hits something like a tree or a moth, the echo comes back and the bat can hear the echo and triangulate the position of whatever the echo bounced off of it. If it's a tree, it can either come in and roost on the tree or it can avoid it. If it picks up an echo that, so a tree would give you a solid echo, right? But if it picks up an echo that's quite fluttery, right? Like the echo that would come off of a moth swings, then the bat can zero in on the moth and eat it. Other really obvious but important points about bats include that bats are not mice. They're not mice with wings. They're actually not even vaguely related to rodents. They're an entirely different group of mammals. They have completely different teeth, which is part of how we classify mammals, so that might sound like it doesn't matter, but that's, that's how we figure out the relationships among groups of mammals. They have completely different teeth, and they have a completely different life history strategy, which means that they just have a completely different approach to how they get through their lives. Mice are fast in everything they do, right? They mature quickly, they're ready to reproduce in a few weeks in some cases, then they have these big litters, those babies are ready to reproduce quickly, and a mouse population can grow very, very quickly. Mice don't live very long, they tend to use really small amounts of, um, of habitat for a single mouse, and that works because they're sharing that habitat with all the other mice that they've produced by this, using this really fast strategy. Bats work a little bit differently. So a uh, little brown bat, which fit in the palm of my hand like this, a little brown bat will have one pup per year. She'll take really good care of that pup. The pup will come out at a quarter of her body weight. And the pup will come out at a quarter of her body weight. And then she'll have to feed it every night until it can fly. And to produce enough milk for that gigantic baby, she's going to have to go and eat half her body weight in insects every night. So the parental investment for a bat is much, much, much higher than for mice, and they're only trying to produce one pup per year. The trade-off is that that pup is going to have a higher survival rate than the mouse's pups, and that it's going to live for a much longer time. So that same little brown bat could be 40 years old when I catch it. 
see what else. If we look at all of the bats on Earth, the diversity, as I already said, is really huge, right? So there's over 1,400 different species, and some of the really obvious differences are in size. On the left here, you have the eastern small-footed bat, which is an Ontario bat, and it weighs about three grams, and it's about the size of my thumb. On the right, you've got a flying fox species that's from the Seychelles Islands, Livingston's fruit bat, and they, as you can see, are quite a lot larger than the eastern small-footed bat. So this is one of the smallest and one of the largest. And um, we sometimes joke that bats are such a great route for studying ecology and evolution because whatever you want to study, there's a bat for that. Whatever you can think of bats doing, there's a bat somewhere that does it. If we look at feeding, for example, there are bats that feed on fish. And the fishing bats tend to have very, very large hind legs, and they actually trawl the fish straight out of the water. So this is a, a species from Central America. But there are also fishing bats in Europe. And the, the species that fish will fly over still water and they're echolocating at the surface of the water. And when they pick up a ripple that might be produced by a fish just under the surface, they come down with their, their enlarged hind legs and they actually gaff a fish right out of the water. They have really, really sharp claws that they can use to grab on. This is a species that gets a lot of media attention. This is a vampire bat. There are three species of vampire bat. This is the common vampire bat. Um, one of those species feeds exclusively on birds, one of, and two of them feed on mammals. And this one is the one that has been studied the best. And among its really neat adaptations, I think you can see, um, I'm trying to use my cursor here. I'm not sure if you can actually see it. Hold on, I'm gonna try using a laser pointer function. Um, okay, so here we've got its nose, right? And you can see it's got this really highly modified nose leaf that actually has a heat sensor built into it so that it can find prey in the dark just by sensing its heat. You can see if you look at the mouth here, it's got these two really sharp incisors and they are razor, razor, razor sharp. They go right into your skin when these things bite. I've never been bitten on one for it to feed on me, but I, I've caught them in gnats and they are unimpressed and they try to bite you um, and like those teeth go right in you barely feel it they've got a groove in their bottom jaw here that they use for sort of funneling up blood while they're drinking it and here's the thing about vampire bats they don't suck the blood the way that you would think of if you think of count dracula right they actually use those razor sharp teeth to make a tiny incision in the skin of their prey so they sneak up on their prey they make a little tiny cut and then they back off again the prey animal barely feels the cut, so it twitches, it's like getting mosquito bite, right? And then it relaxes again. And the vampire bat has an anticoagulant in its saliva, so that after it makes the bite, the blood from the prey starts flowing and the bat can sneak back up and just sit there and, and lick the blood as it flows out of the wound, but it doesn't have to worry about the prey noticing it and potentially trying to scare it away. The other neat thing about vampire bats is that because they are feeding on prey that they have to sneak up on, they have, there's my cat in the background yelling, um, because they are sneaking up on prey, they, they need all sorts of different ways to do this. So the one that feeds on birds will actually hang under the branch that the bird is roosting on and sort of sloth crawl towards the, or commando crawl towards the bird. But the common vampire bat um, feeds on mammals and it, it, at the moment, specializes on cattle because that's what there is a lot of in its range. So they'll land on, in the field next to, the cow that they want to feed off of, or they'll land gently on the cow's back and then they'll feed. But if they have to get away quickly, they're one of the only species that can take off quickly from the ground. And they can actually run on the ground, which most bats can't do. So they use these really strong front, or forearms, sorry. Um, they fold their wings up and they use these really strong forearms, sort of like, um, like crutches to just throw themselves along the ground and they can, they can move really quickly that way. The bats that we have here are all insect eaters, and each species prefers slightly different groups of insects, but most of them are generalists, because if you are eating insects and you're catching them by flying around in the air at night and echolocating, you can't really afford to be picky, right? You need to take whatever you can find. So given a choice, they might have some preferences, but if, um, 
if you look at the, the diet of bats in Ontario across time, it tends to reflect whatever has just hatched out. So you'll get a whole ton of mayflies in there in their guano in the spring when the mayflies come out and then you'll get a whole ton of beetles later on and then a whole ton of whatever the next, the next group is. And there's lots of nectar and fruit eating bats as well. The nectar feeders have tongues that can reach really far into flowers, kind of like a hummingbird. And the fruit bats look mostly like these ones. And these are a group of fruit bats that are found in Africa and Asia. They're the ones that often get called flying foxes. And these honestly are the fruit bats that we pull out if we're talking to a group that really doesn't like bats at all because they're the ones that people can identify with the most quickly because they look the most like your puppy or your kitten, right? And then there's all these specialized roost types as well. So for example, um, we have some bats that like to roost just under crevices in bark. This is an extreme example. Often they'll wedge themselves a little farther in. Um, these are a bunch of bats in Europe roosting in a cave. And this is a, a group of bats that actually do hang directly from the ceiling with their feet. And then they I love how they wrap themselves up in their wings like through the Dracula cape. This is a particularly bizarre uh, species. This is Thyroptera tricolored, which is one of the sucker-footed bats. Um, Thyroptera has these suction cups on its thumbs, and that's because it roosts in these rolled up heliconia leaves. And if you're looking down into the leaf, that's what it looks like. And the, the surface of the leaf, leaf is slick. It's, it's almost as slick as glass. There's nothing for their claws to hold on to. And so they use these suction cups instead. And if you put one of these inside a glass and turn it upside down, it can actually suction cup itself onto the side of the glass. So the way you find these is basically walking through um, forest within their range. And when you see a rolled up heliconia leaf, you sort of sneak up to it and grab the top so that they can't get out. If you flick the leaf and there's thyroptor in there, they're out of it before you can get them. So you sneak up to these rolls and you grab the top and then tip it towards towards you like Yumi is doing in this picture and you can you can peek inside that way. There are all sorts of other ways that bats use leaves to create roosts. So these ones have actually bitten the edges along the veins of this leaf to cause it to droop down into a tent and then they've roosted underneath like this. And then there are some bats that like to roost underneath. And then, of course, um, the bats that are eating nectar are also ingesting pollen and they act as pollinators and move the pollen from one flower to another. So they're performing a really important service in their ecosystems that way. I am um, the, the weirdest study that I ever participated in was this one. Um, uh, Dara was a student in Brock Fenton's lab and, and they were chatting and thinking about fruit bats eating fruit. and sort of speculating that well the fruit ferments at some point right and so do we think that the bats can tolerate that little bit of alcohol that ends up in the fruit and so Dara actually came up with a, a study design to test this and um, decided to use Bacardi only because she found the, um, the logo was so appropriate she couldn't resist it so we caught a whole bunch of bats for her she basically spiked some fruit juice with small amounts of Bacardi following an approved animal care protocol. We were not doing anything terrible to the fruit bats. Um, and then we helped her to build a, a, an obstacle course. So it was basically just a, a tunnel that we could fly the bats through that we helped her hang sort of chains from the edges of and different obstacles she could readjust that the bats would have to fly through. And she gave them different doses of alcohol and then tested whether it affected their flying performance, which it didn't, which was kind of neat. So that's just scratching the surface and that's kind of a wild tour through some of the most bizarre bats that are out there but it hopefully gives you some idea of how diverse bats actually are and I, I wanted to start with that only because the species that we have here while they're amazing and I love them we don't have as much diversity and so if I only t tell you about the species we have in Ontario you don't really get the whole picture so I want to switch gears a little and talk about why the bats here and elsewhere are in trouble and then we'll also talk a bit about what you can do to help. So you're all dedicated naturalists, and I, I think most of you probably saw the media coverage that this report got 
last year. So this is a report from uh, one of the biodiversity monitoring organizations that tracks biodiversity trends over time and then reports on them to governments and also to the public. So this is every intergovernmental science policy platform platform, excuse me, on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And they listed the five greatest threats to wildlife and to us. And we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up to the biggest one. So here we go. The five greatest threats to wildlife and us, and we can link them also to bats. So number five was invasive species. And invasive species are a problem for bats in many ways, but one of the main threats to bats in Ontario is this invasive species. Um, outdoor cats kill thousands of bats every year and also birds and I'm sure you're aware that probably the single greatest impact you can have on biodiversity conservation in Ontario is to keep your cat inside if you have one and I know I grew up with outdoor cats and I know they love going outside they are they're very good at what they do um, and a friend of mine works on a cat project uh, out of the University of Guelph and they actually take cameras and they hang them from people's pet cats necks, with obviously with people's agreement <laughs> and then you know cat hangs out and does its cat thing and the family hangs out with the cat and everything's normal and they come back and get the camera afterwards and the cats behave completely differently when somebody's watching them so the same family that fills out the survey at the beginning of participating in the study and says oh yeah my cat just lies around and never doesn't chase anything doesn't do anything it's so interesting. You can see on the camera how the cat's lying around very innocently until the person gets up and goes inside and then it's out there stalking things. And they change their behavior when we're around. So please keep your cats indoors. But then there are other invasive species that are problems as well. So this one is much smaller than cats. It's probably one you've heard of. This is the fungus that causes white nose syndrome in bats. So if we move south from here, across the border into New York State, we'll get to ground zero for white nose syndrome. And in 2006, a biologist there first noticed this sort of fuzzy looking growth on hibernating bats that he was monitoring. So you can see these red noses here, or sorry, white noses here where the red arrows are pointing. And that's not, that's not a normal look for a hibernating bat. You usually see the little black bat nose peeking down at you. And so he hadn't seen this before and then took some samples, got in touch with some um, fungus scientists, some mycologists, and they identified it as a species that wasn't previously described by science. Um, the, turns out the species came from Europe and was probably introduced to North America by cavers. But the problem is that once it was identified, caving was shut down as much as possible. Researchers working with bats were really careful not to spread this fungus but the bats spread it themselves. And the fungus doesn't hurt the bats in the active season. It only affects them in the winter when they're hibernating. And so they're really able to spread it in the summer. They don't notice that they're carrying it. And when they go back into hibernation, it starts growing on them and it grows on their noses and it grows on their wings. And uh, when, the, when the growth gets to a certain point, it's actually able to grow into their skin in some places and it creates these lesions, these little sores on the wings and the nose and the ears and it actually causes them to lose water more quickly in the winter than they normally would because the skin on their wings is not intact. A hibernating bat drops everything down to the temperature of the cave or the mine that it's in. And that can be two to six degrees, right? It's really cold, it's just above freezing. And it slows everything down, so its heartbeat will be maybe once a minute. And it's breathing really slowly. And all of that is an effort to conserve its energy until the spring. And also to conserve water as much as possible because it, when it gets too thirsty, it has to wake up to get a drink and that takes energy. And if it uses its energy too quickly, it might not survive to the spring. And what happens with white nose is that because the bats are losing water too quickly and because they're really itchy and uncomfortable because they're covered with these lesions, they end up waking up much more often than they normally would. They burn up their precious fat stores and they start before the spring comes. And so there's been, millions and millions and millions of bats killed across North America. This is just showing you the spread of white nose syndrome. So right here where the laser pointer is, that's Schoharie County where it was first recognized and probably where it was introduced, although we're not sure. And then you can see that the color gradient is just showing you 
where it was first detected in subsequent years. And you can see that first it spread out to this area, then it spread down the Appalachian Mountains, it spread up into Quebec and Ontario and out to the Maritimes, and it's only recently made it to Newfoundland, it's only recently made it to Manitoba, and it's only recently made it to the West Coast, and it did this big leapfrog from across the Great Plains to get to the West Coast. So it's caused the mortality of all these bats since 2006, and that's really, really tragic. Um, it's, it's one of the most dramatic wildlife declines ever documented. And there were these horrific photos circulating of just piles of bones on the floors of some of these hibernation sites. Um, the good news is that some bats actually have managed to survive white nose syndrome. And so one of the things that we're trying to understand is what's different about those bats and what the effects of white nose syndrome are on bats that have survived several winters of being infected with white nose syndrome but haven't died. One of the things that we've looked at is whether those bats are more stressed as a result. And it turns out you can measure stress hormones in the, um, in the nail tissue of bats the same way that you can measure it in your hair and nails. And so we collected, <laughs> we collected tiny, tiny nail samples from <laughs> that's this tube. So I'm holding this tube, my hand's not that large. Um, it's a tiny, tiny tube and it's containing all of the nails off of a single bat that had died of white nose syndrome. So I wouldn't be able to take the nails like this off of a, um, off of a live bat because it wouldn't be able to hold on to its, its roost, right? But we collected them from bats that had died of white nose syndrome and we were able to show that, in fact, bats that have died of white nose syndrome are more stressed than bats that are tested previous, uh, sorry, bats that are tested prior to being exposed to white nose syndrome. Sorry, end of the day and my sentences are not there. And again, we do see that some of them are persisting. So the sites that I monitor, the hibernation sites that I monitor near Peterborough and up in Renfrew County and up towards Ottawa, um, they had 95% declines when white nose syndrome hit. They went from 30,000 bats to, in one case, from 30,000 to 1,000, which was a greater than 95% decline. Um, I honestly thought that they were just slowly on their way to extinction. Those larger sites that had 30,000 bats and then went down to 1,000, and I was waiting for them to just peter out, they're actually going up again. So I think there is some hope, but whether the bats that are still persisting are able to make it out of this slump is going to depend on how well we take care of them and the rest of their habitat. If we go back to our list of greatest threats we've done invasive species, the next threat on the list is pollution. I'm not going to dwell on this one, but obviously polluted habitats that are unhealthy for people are also unhealthy for bats. And anything that you can do to keep your part of the planet cleaner is directly going to help the recovery of endangered bats. Climate change, I'm also not going to dwell on too long, um, but some of the most obvious ways that climate change can affect bats is by changing access to food and water resources. So bats have this really, really tight window in which they can reproduce, right? Bats in Ontario anyways. We have a very short summer, so they have to hibernate through the winter, then they have to come out of hibernation. Now they have to come out of hibernation with white nose syndrome, so they are starving in the spring when they come out. They have to go out there and catch enough insects for the females to be able to build a gigantic baby that weighs a quarter of their body weight. Then that female has to have the pup, and go back out there and feed half her body weight in insects every night to be able to make enough milk for that pup. Or in this case, this is a big brown bat mother and she's got twins holding on to her. Don't worry, we hung her back up again and she was fine, <laughs> so were the twins. Um, they, have to do, they, they have to access all of this energy in a very short time frame to be able to get the pups ready to fly by the mid or, middle or end of July and then to get them out there and let the pups fatten up enough that they are gonna survive hibernation as well. The way that climate change shifts our weather patterns, it creates a big mismatch for animals that have to do everything on a really tight schedule. So if change in climate shifts the timing of big pulses of emerging insects, for example, then the bats might not be able to find as much food as they need right when they need it. 
And if climate change shifts um, the, the time at which it becomes warm enough to emerge from a cave and hunt for insects, but then causes sort of a cold, rainy summer where it's hard to hunt for insects because bats don't hunt well in the rain because their echolocation bounces off all the raindrops, then you sort of have this rolling energy debt that the bats can never really catch up to. The second, um, the second item on this list, so the, the second most grave threat to wildlife and us globally, does apply to bats, but it doesn't really apply to them in Ontario. I'm going to share it with you anyways. Um, the second one is overharvest, and we don't intentionally harvest bats in Canada, mostly because they're just too small for it to be worth it, right? Like you wouldn't, you'd get a little bony crunch and that would be it. I don't, yes, don't recommend it. Um, but some bats are hunted for food elsewhere because there are places where the bats are large enough, right? Um, I found this recipe <laughs> online. This is a recipe for fruit bat soup. And there are lots of places where bats are a completely standard part of the diet and uh, you can buy them at the grocery store shrink wrapped, right? Um, there's nothing unethical about that. There's nothing ethically different about eating a bat than about hunting a deer and eating it or about raising a cow and eating it. Um, the, the catch is, that in many cases it's not a sustainable harvest because many of these species have already been pushed to the brink of extinction and it's unfair to the people who are harvesting them to blame that all on harvesting because that's not what's going on there are all of those other things interacting right climate change is happening if if you can't find your food elsewhere you're going to go hunt bats right there are all of these other issues in the mix um so i'm not i'm not saying that it's bad to eat bats but when it happens at an unsustainable rate if it keeps going, it's going to lead to extinctions. And of course, we do harvest bats in Ontario. We just don't do it on purpose for food. So wind turbines are a major source of mortality for bats, um, which collide with the turbines and especially during the spring and fall migrations. This is another really tricky one. We need wind energy to help us deal with threat number three. Remember, we had climate change on the list. We need wind energy. We just do, we need good sources of renewable energy. So then the, the question becomes, how can we develop the wind energy sector in a way that doesn't compromise all of our flying biodiversity? And I think that that is 100% possible and it's only a matter of will. So Ontario has guidelines for the operation of wind energy facilities that can help to minimize bat mortality. Um, how those are enforced, varies depending on who all of you lovely people vote into power. Um, but we, we have those guidelines in place and we know what to do. If you shut down the turbines from dawn till dusk for a six week period, you can reduce the mortality by about 90%. And that period coincides with a time of fairly low energy demand at night as well. So there are tools that we have to be able to reduce bat mortality. We just would need to use them effectively. And then last, the greatest threat to wildlife, which includes bats and us, is this one. And this report was a bit of a game changer for me in the way that my team works on species at risk because it said the thing that hadn't been really clearly communicated to the public, I think, for a while. Habitat loss and modification, like we all know it's a problem. Everyone's been talking about it for years, right? Like I was learning in grade three about the loss of the Amazon rainforest. And I, you know, we, we know that this is a problem, but with the pressure to discuss climate change and focus on wildlife trade and invasive species and pollution and all the other things, this one had sort of become lost in the mix in terms of prioritizing. And so the, the game changer in this report is that they put this right up at the top. And the nice thing about this is that this is probably the threat that each of us individually can do the most about. Not saying that you can go out and make a large protected area by yourselves, but, but what we do to actually steward really high quality habitat on whatever small part of the earth we are taking care of 
provides habitat for species. And the more everybody does that, the bigger an impact we can have. And of course, what really also needs to be happening is um, habitat protection at, at a really large scale. So politically backed habitat protection. And every time that Ontario or Canada designates new protected areas or puts more resources into protecting the ones we already have, that's a huge win for biodiversity and that includes bats. If we look at like the specific links between habitat loss and bats, a lot of it comes back to the ability of a habitat to sustain a healthy insect population. For our Ontario bats, they eat insects. If they can't find enough insects, nothing else that we do is going to be enough. And so they also need some safe places to roost and raise their pups while they're feeding on all of those insects. There's several species that have been able to switch to buildings really successfully but not all of them. And so the more we can protect forests that can provide roosting habitat for bats, that can provide habitat for the insects the bats rely on, the more we protect wetlands, which are also really key sources of insect prey for bats, the better we're protecting the bats um, prey source. That's the same, you've all done this, right? Like that's the same canoe shot with, with the flash turned on and I was maybe not a huge fan of those particular insects, but they are, they are bat food. This is one of the roost sites that we monitor. So there's a colony of big brown bats in the roof of this building. You will recognize this as standard parks issue, um, park board. So the, the bats actually exit right up at the top here. And then we've set these, these harp traps in front to catch the bats as they come out. So there's two banks. There's, there's a metal frame here, and then you can just see at the top, there's a second metal frame, also a square, that's about that far apart from the first one. Both of those are strung with fishing line at regular intervals. And basically what happens is the bats fly out, they're echolocating or they're using their quite good eyesight, and they notice the first set of fishing line. They turn completely sideways in the air, and they squeeze right in between those two lines. But then they, you can't fly sideways forever, right? So then they have to right themselves and they slam into that next set of line and they fall down into these convenient little bags and then they hang out in there until we come and get them. We're monitoring colonies and buildings partly as a way to track populations, but also we're trying to understand more about how bats use this kind of habitat because when bats use a building, that is habitat for those bats. If you're not in a position to you know, help to steward a forest or a wetland or, you know, a more natural kind of habitat, don't think for a second that this building is less important to those bats than the stand of forest that's over here in the picture. It's not. This is, this is their roosting habitat. And just because it's built by humans doesn't make them less reliant on it. So whatever you can do um, to steward bat-used buildings in a really friendly way, is also helping bats. There's obviously going to be cases where you don't want bats in your buildings and that's okay too because there are real public health reasons not to want bats in your house. Um, if you have to do an exclusion, basically the deal is you don't, you don't have a problem if the bats are using a different part of the building from you. So if they're up in an attic up here and you're using this living space down here and you're not meeting each other, you're fine. You are completely fine. If you start ending up with a lot of bats in your living space, I mean, there are legitimate concerns about rabies and so on. And like rabies is very, very rare in bats, but it's there and please don't get rabies, it's deadly. Um, so there's gonna be times where you will want to exclude bats from a building. And the trick is to do that when they're not raising their pups. So wait until the pups are flying in late July, early August. And then you do the exclusion and there are lots of really good wildlife control companies that can help do this humanely. They can install one way exits so the bats can get themselves out just fine. And then once the bats are all out and they're sure that there aren't any more coming out, they can come back, they can seal up the entrance and hopefully the bats won't come back. Sometimes it takes a few tries. Um, but what you really don't want to do is accidentally seal the pups into the building and the moms on the outside. Uh, okay, so the last thing that I wanted to run by you is this idea of um, other types of habitat. So we're looking at a picture here. We've got, we've got water, right? We've got aquatic habitat and we've got nice little woodlot there. We've got some terrestrial ha habitat here and 
different types of terrestrial habitat, probably some agricultural lands. What we don't have in our in our government policy at the moment, and I'm not I'm not speaking for the government of Ontario in any way. This is an international thing. Nowhere in the world do we have a clear policy recognizing this as habitat. So if you're a bat and you are depending on aquatic insects emerging from the water, okay, the aquatic habitat is important. And if you're depending on this area for roosting sites, perhaps, then that terrestrial habitat is important. But the minute you start foraging or migrating, you're up into the aerial habitat and that's not recognized and it's not protected. And so one of, one of the um, real improvements that I think we need to wildlife protection policy, not just in Ontario or Canada, but all around the world, is to recognize aerial habitats for what they are and for how important they are, and to protect them that way. We don't have a good way to, to measure the importance of those spaces yet, and that's something that uh, my research team and a bunch of other teams are working on at the moment. But um, I think that would be the real game changer for being able to protect bats and really turn around declines in bats and in other flying species as well. So I think I'm going to stop there for now, if that's okay. Um, and I'd love to take any questions that you have. And I see one in the chat. <laughs> Thanks very much, Christina. So anybody um, who has any questions, I think there are some already in there. Um, just click on chat and then uh, you can type your questions at the bottom of the, the screen, uh, the bottom right hand, and then hit enter and then uh, Christina can see them. Perfect. And the, the first one that I can see there um, has a number, not a name, so I'm, I'm not sure who I'm speaking to, my apologies. Um, but the question is, doesn't white nose syndrome cause them to wake up using food reserves? And yes, it does. But it's, it's not, um, okay, so it's normal for bats to wake up a few times during the winter, even if they're not disturbed. They run out of water, they have to go pee, it's like you waking up in the middle of the night, right? So they wake up, they do that um, by raising their body temperature above ambient, so they'll be, they'll be roosting on the side of the mine. If the mine's three degrees and the part of the rock they're on is two and a half degrees, then the bat is two and a half degrees Celsius. It has to get itself back up to its active temperature, which is the same or a little higher than ours. And that takes it, can, it can take over 40 minutes in some cases if it's, if it's not in a rush. Um, the bats have brown fat deposits on either side of their spine on their back. And brown fat is a particular kind of adipose tissue, a kind of fatty tissue that we have as babies and then mostly lose. But bats retain it as adults and they use it as kind of the engine that fires up their, um, their metabolism. And so if you take a thermal camera and you watch a bat that's heating up, the bat's the same color, the same temperature as the rock, right? And then just on its back, you can see these two little areas start to light up and they get warmer and warmer and warmer and the warmth gradually spreads the whole way through the bat's body. And then the bat can go pee or get a drink or whatever it is that it needs and it goes back to sleep. The difference with white nose syndrome is not in the way that the bat wakes up, it's still using the same process. It's just in the frequency because the bat dehydrates more quickly or it's uncomfortable because it has these lesions. And there's only so much brown fat that the bat stored, right? So once it uses it all up, it runs out of options basically. And so you, you'll often get bats leaving a hibernation site early if they're, maybe they're looking for food, but it's still March and there's snow on the ground and they can't find any insects and you'll get them either starving or freezing to death that way. Um, what else we got? Okay, we have from James, how effective are bat boxes? That is a great question. Bat boxes, okay, it depends. It depends on the type of bat box you put up. And I can tell you a few tips, but what kind of bat box is best is an active research question and we will hopefully know more in a few years because there are a couple teams working on this and in particular if you visit the wildlife conservation society's website they have a bat box project um, that's being led um, in part by dr Corey lawson out in bc and they're testing all different 
all different bat boxes and what the temperatures look like in them and how many bats they attract. The trick with bat boxes here is that bats like a warm roost. So if you put a bat box in the shade in Ontario, even on a really hot day, it's unlikely to be a comfortable temperature for a bat except during a heat wave when you might suddenly get a bunch of bats move into it because it's the equivalent of moving into the air-conditioned room. So ideally, you want to put your bat boxes on the south-facing side of ideally a building up high beyond where a predator can get to it. What you don't want to do is attach your bat box to the side of a tree. And I say this having made my dad a bat box years ago and we put it on a tree. But now I know the problem is that the um, predator can run straight up the trunk and into the bottom of the bat box. So you want to put it up on a wall where it's hard for a predator to get to it. And that's your best bet. What the other, the other thing about bat boxes is often they don't get used in the first few years. It takes bats a while to find them, even if you've put it in a good place and even if there's bats locally that need it. I'm in my house right now. I like my house. I'm not moving. If my house got knocked over by a tornado, I would go find somewhere else, right? It's the same thing with bats. If they don't, if they're not getting evicted from their current roost and there's nothing really wrong with it, they're more likely to go back to the place that they already like. But if you put the bat box up and nothing happens, you're still creating that extra habitat so that if a colony does get excluded, they'll have a whole bunch of other roosts mapped out, even if they're not actively using them. And so they'll be, they'll know that there's this box here and maybe they can move into that. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, what else we got? Uh, Mary is asking, we had a small bat population in our place a few years ago, but they are gone. Is there any way we can encourage more bats to return? I think that the short answer to that is if you are maintaining habitat that has some trees, and is good for insects, you could put up a few bat boxes. Again, it, it might not encourage them to come in, but if local bats get excluded, then they will have scoped out your bat box as an option. Those are the things you can do. And then the rest of it is just luck of the draw, where you are, where the local bats like to hang out. Um, I will say that you, you may have a lot of bats and just not know it. Unless you're out there with a bat detector, which probably many of you have been, so good. Um, but unless you're out there with a bat detector, it can be really difficult to know how active things actually are. Um, there's a, one, one of the caves that we monitor for bats, um, in August when the bats come in and swarm, so this is their mating time, you get like hundreds of bats at some sites. Some sites are, you know, 20 a night, some sites are 700 a night. Um, one of the caves that we monitor is privately owned, and we spoke to the owner and said, can we come, can we come trap at your cave and see if it's a swarming site? And he said, you're not going to get any bats. And they show up in the winter, but I don't get, I don't have bats in my cave in the summer. And I said, well, I mean, if I hang out all night long at the front of your cave with part of my team, like, does that bother you? And he said, no, I mean, if you can do that. We got 50 bats in half an hour because they showed up at 10 p.m. when nobody was there and they were there until 2 a.m. And then they were gone. And if you were there during the day, you would never even have known they'd been there. So if you are creating good habitat for bats, that's, that's the part that you can do. And you may never know whether it's being used, but it, it will still be helpful. Um, Pat's also asking why wetlands are especially good bat habitat. And it, that's pretty directly linked to um, insect abundance in wetlands because a lot of those aquatic insects hatch out of the water, right? And the bats know that and they basically come in and grab those as the insects are taking off the water they'll skim down and grab them as they're hatching and when they're when they're easier to catch. Uh, Brenda has a really good question about bat boxes. Um, I was given a bat box how do I make sure it's not infected with the white ghost syndrome and should boxes be cleaned at any point? You do not need to clean bat boxes. The way that they're built um, the bats will go fly in from underneath and when they're pooping, it'll fall right down. You don't need to worry about it. The scent actually probably is good for attracting new bats to use the bat box because they'll smell that a bat has used it and decide that that means that it's safe. Um, how much the scent matters, again, is something that's, that people are experimenting with at the moment. So I can't give you a really clear answer, except that once bats start using a bat box, you get more. And so we think that the scent is important. So no, you don't need to clean it. 
The question about white nose syndrome is also a really good one. At this point, we have white nose syndrome here. The fungus that causes it is here. The bats have spread it all the way up to the interlakes region of Manitoba. We can't get rid of it. There's no, honestly, there's no point in even trying. There's been a lot of research gone into thinking of ways to do that. At this point, we are just depending on natural selection and the process of evolution to help the populations that are still here that are tolerant of white nose syndrome to grow and remain tolerant to white nose syndrome and that's the strategy. So you don't need to worry about cleaning it because it would become infected the minute the bats go into it. Whether they're going to leave enough spores that another bat can pick it up from your bat box, depends how many bats go in, you don't need to worry about it. It's here, it's a done deal. So. Um, what you do need to worry about is if you've been near bats or if you've been in a cave or mine, ideally you're not going into caves and mines for safety reasons, but if you've been in a cave or a mine or if you've been anywhere where there's piles of bat guano in an attic, in a barn with a bat colony, and in a ideal post-COVID world you're getting on a plane again to fly somewhere fun, what you really don't want to do is wear the same clothes unwashed that you had in that site or carry the same equipment that you had without really cleaning it with bleach or wear the same shoes that you had without bleaching them and then go somewhere like British Columbia where they don't have white nose syndrome yet. Here we already have it, but if you're going somewhere farther away then you do need to worry about spreading it. Um, okay, we have, this is Jeff, is the Ontario government aware that shutting down turbines at night reduces mortality significantly? If so, have they acted to implement this as a requirement on wind farm approvals? That's a really good question. Um, and if, if I wasn't clear, then I'm, I'm glad I get the chance to clarify that. So yes, the Ontario government is aware of that. Um, and I, I get in my, in my job, I get to work really closely with the section that, um, that provides guidance to the wind energy, energy industry. And the wind energy industry really does want to reduce bat mortality. So there are ongoing discussions about this. The current guidelines from the government of Ontario to wind energy operators state that if you find, so the first they state that if you put up a wind energy facility, you have to do three years of post-construction monitoring. So all of those energy operators have signed on for three years of hiring ecological consultants to walk around the base of the turbines. They, they pick a subset of turbines and they walk around the base of the turbines regularly through the summer and they count the number of carcasses they find for bats and for birds and they report all of those numbers back to the ministry. They do that for three solid years. There are thresholds in place. If they exceed the thresholds, then they're asked to use various mitigation options. And the one in the guidelines that's most commonly used is shutting the turbines down from dusk to dawn um, du during that migration period. So that is, that is one of the options for mitigation. Um, the other thing that they are asked to do is um, change the cut-in speed of the turbines. So bear with me here, it's not that complicated. <laughs> it's just jargon. Um, when a turbine's spinning, the cut-in speed is the wind speed at which the turbine starts producing energy. So the standard in Ontario is 3.5 meters per second. When the wind hits 3.5 meters per second, the turbine starts to produce electricity. If you, and, and we know that bats tend to get killed more at low wind speeds than at high wind speeds. So one of the mitigation options that the government typically recommends in Ontario at the moment is to increase the cut-in speed to 5.5 meters per second because at that wind speed you get lower bat kills than at 3.5 meters per second. So, so yes, there are, there are mitigation measures in place and they, they, do get, um, they do get implemented and there are ongoing conversations between the wind farm operators and the Ministry of Natural Resources to determine which of those mitigation measures are the best in which case. Um, we've got from Nicole, I think there are bats around my house because we live by a lake and a forest, but I've never seen a bat here. Where would their favorite spots be? So if you're near the island in Port Perry, then you should definitely have bats around your house. Um, 
So the favorite spot's gonna depend on the species. There are three or four species that like to hunt over water around dusk, especially over still water specifically. Um, then there's uh, going to be species that are hunting up above the tree canopy as well. But seeing them can be really tricky. So probably if you wanted to scope out what you had, your best option would be to try and borrow a bat detector from somebody and take it out on the back, back porch sometime and see what you can hear after dark. Um, you basically, they, they have a dial on them that changes the frequency that the detector is listening at, and they convert ultrasound to noise that you can hear. So if I turn the dial to 40 kilohertz, which is way above what I can hear, if I turn the dial to 40 kilohertz, then if a 40 kilohertz call goes by, I'm gonna hear tick, 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 tick on the bat detector, and I know that a bat calling at 40 kilohertz has gone by, and that's one of whatever species. Um, so that would be, that would probably be your best bet to check out whether you have bats around. And then Brenda's asking what the most common species of bat in the Durham region is. So the most common species that you'll find in a house are the little brown bat and the big brown bat. And by big, like this is a little brown bat, this is a big brown bat. They're not really large. Um, the wingspan of a little brown bat's like that, wingspan of a big brown's like that. So people think they're much bigger than they are because once they're flying, they look larger, but they're really not. Um, those are the species you tend to get in houses. Um, and then you're also going to have roosting in your trees in the park. Um, the largest species in Ontario, which is called the hoary bat, which is by large, I mean, like this. <laughs> Just, it looks a little bit like a little lion. Um, and those are the high flyers. They roost in trees. They, 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 they're way up where you, you don't normally see them. Um, but you probably also have red bats in your area in Durham and um, the eastern small-footed bat that I showed you all the picture of, that really tiny one. That one actually likes to roost under stones. So like on talus slopes or in some of the rock barrens that you get up on the shield. They really like to roost under some of those same rocks where you'll find skinks and snakes. And, other crevice lovers. I think that's all your questions and I hope that I've answered them okay, but if anybody would like to follow up, please feel free. There's one more, I think. Uh, are, are all species susceptible to white nose syndrome? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So, okay, we have, we have eight species in Ontario, five of them hibernate. All five that hibernate are susceptible to white nose syndrome. The other three, the red bat, the hoary bat, and the silver haired bat migrate south for the winter. And as far as we know, they don't get white nose syndrome, but we're really not entirely sure what they do when they migrate south for the winter. So it's possible that they are hibernating, but farther south and somewhere that we don't know about and we're just not finding them. Um, the fungus has been detected on those species but I don't think anyone's ever found an individual of those species that was showing symptoms of the actual disease. So as far as we know, it's the five hibernating species, but not the other ones. Okay, that was so great, Christina. I thought I knew a lot about bats, but apparently I still have a lot to learn because <laughs> there was a lot of stuff in your presentation about bats that I didn't know, so that was great. Um, Thanks everyone for your wonderful questions and uh, thanks Christina for your time. Uh, it was a really great presentation. Uh, James, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, thank you so much, Christina. I, I learned more about bats too. I think it was really nice how you showed us some of the bats in different parts of the world and some of the truly amazing things about them and then, and then kind of brought home with with our bats in Ontario and the whole issue of the disease. And I think we're kind of aware of some of these issues, like your five things, we're sort of know about all of those, but it was nice putting them in order. And yeah, it, uh, I really thought it was, cause one of my questions was, which you really answered was, what is the status now? And it sounds like maybe there is some hope, maybe uh, some of them are starting to come back a little bit, but. Anyway, I would certainly like to second my great appreciation for you taking time to give us this present, this great presentation, and I'm sure everyone really learned a lot more about that. So thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation.
Thanks. And everybody have a uh, great night and be safe and stay healthy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Christina.